All right, I'm going to move quickly here because I want to get to a couple rabbit holes. Um, as a lot of you know, I'm uh, revising my identification guide in North American birds, and as typical, I guess it's taken a lot longer than I'd hoped. Um, and one of the reasons is I keep finding rabbit holes to go down. <laughs> so I want to take you down a couple of rabbit holes. And as those who know me know that once I go down a rabbit hole, I don't come up until every speck of dirt has been analyzed. So the first rabbit hole here is um, the, uh, uh, is this thing visible here? The, the control thing? Probably not. We see your screen, rabbit okay. hole number one. Okay, very good. Um, is uh, clarifying the molts of eight species of hummingbirds that occur in the Southwest primarily. And these are Rivoli's, blue throated mountain jam, lucifers, broad-billed, white-eared violet crown, barreline, and buff-bellied. And as an example of what I was, uh, was uh, running across, now why isn't my thing? Okay, there we go. Um, for broad-billed hummingbird, for example, um, in 1997, I concluded that a uh, certain thing about the performative molt occurred in November to May, and the pre-basic in October to April. Steve Howell concluded a different set of month ranges for both, and Sherry Williamson um, concluded a third set, and the birds of North America concluded a fourth set, which actually, um, that's Powers and Weatherington came closer to what I ended up finding because of Susan Weatherington's good work with uh, Malt in Arizona. Uh, but note all the authors indicated that the uh, preformative malt was complete and the pre-basic malt was quite protracted. So, and I also, uh, good talk by the way, Desi, um, wanted to uh, see how the, um, see how malts in these species might fit in with uh, clarifying malt and plumage terminology as well. That's been a, a subject of mine, especially since we were able to document um, pre-alternate molts in a couple of species. Okay, so it started innocently enough. You know, I thought, okay, maybe I'll look at a couple of photos of broad bill hummingbird and see if I can figure anything out. And so I went to uh, Macaulay and, and uh, clicked on and um, it's the Cornell Labs Ornithology's Macaulay Library, which is the focus of this talk. But, um, as you can see, there's a tremendous resource here uh, to be able to study not just molt, but subspecies and a lot of other things. And as of this morning, there were almost 30 million images loaded into Macaulay. So I'm gonna go quickly through the molt section here to save time for subspecies, but, um, you know, and also because molt is kind of esoteric and <clears throat> boring to a lot of people. But I asked Steve to put the, um, URL link into the chat box. This is a preprint, which is uh, an ability now to put unpublished manuscripts online for others to view and comment on before you publish them. So this one's currently in review at uh, Wilson. But if you go to this uh, link, you can download the PDF and the supplementary material and find out more about uh, what I'm doing here. Uh, I do want to spend a little time with methods since um, that's really critical to this whole thing. Um, a lot of you know this now, you know, when I did this project, it was started this project, it was about a year ago, and I wasn't quite sure how all it went, but now I am. And so from the eBird homepage, you hit explore here, and then you hit search photos and sounds, and then you put your species in here into the box and up come photos. And just a note here that there's 15,222 images of broad build in the um, library now as of this morning. Um, then filtering is real important. And I know Bryce Robinson was gonna go through this a little bit with you before he got cut off, but so I got you covered. Um, the things that were important for this study to filter for were location, date, and this box over here. Uh, which is covered by my thing here. Let me move this out of the way. Recently uploaded. Um, and then, so once you hit location, you have, and the filtering system that Macaulay has is amazing to me, uh, very superb. Um, you have a choice of entering 
where you want to uh, limit your photos to. So for this project, I limited it mainly to the United States. For and for about four species, five species, I had enough data to do everything from the U.S. Um, but for the others, I had to go down to the Mexican plateau, which I was then able to filter for Mexico and find those birds as well. Um, and then what I did is I went month by month. So I start with July. You know, July uh, all years means since 1901 or whatever, and um, and came up. And in this case, there were 1,554 images of broadbill hummingbird taken in July. So it's quite a sample size to be able to work through. And then over here, um, you have a choice between recently uploaded, best quality, date of newest first, and so on. And I chose date of newest first um, because that allowed me to actually track individuals. And so I could, you'd hit an individual, say a vagrant off, and then, and then you'd be able to just know it was the same bird and not include it in the sample size because it's the same individual. And this gets also back to what Hannah Floyd was talking about the other day about being able to watch a single bird all the way through the molt process. And I think the record was a broad-billed hummingbird vagrant back in North Carolina that probably had 400 photos and I was able to track it through the entire molt. So that was the process I went through, put those filters on and then go month by month and categorize each hummingbird into the, these six categories, juvenile, undergoing preformative molt, formative, undergoing second pre-basic, definitive basic, and undergoing definitive pre-basic molt. And you can see I had some big sample sizes here. And this was a year ago, I had 8,842. Now that's up to 15,000. Um, and by going through a process, I eliminated the same bird and came up with 2,413 individuals by month. These are the numbers by month, 639 in July. And there were less of some of the species, but the range went from 280 in white eared uh, to 2413 in, in uh, broad build. So the first thing I wanted to look at was sequence. And um, the sequence I found to be absolutely fixed and as reported in the literature, where instead of like the storm petrels, Desi mentioned, go from P1 to P10, hummingbirds do something funny. They get to P8 and then they drop P10 and P9 is the last um, feather dropped. And so I was able to uh, confirm in all 2000 plus uh, images of birds in active molt, I did not find any exception to this. And I also was able to document that the secondary start in the middle with S1 and S6 and converge, and that S4, the fourth secondary, is almost always the last feather replaced. So timing was not so uh, fixed, is more plastic in these eight species. And I'll quickly just point out that the beige here is preformative molt, the green is pre-basic molt, uh, definitive pre-basic molt, and then the purple are birds I identified as being in second pre-basic molt. And just a quick note that the timing is relatively fixed. You can see that for most species that's not protracted like I thought it was. And, and that as far as month ranges went, nobody had it right before. So this is able to eliminate that. Uh, extent of mold is also pretty plastic. Um, it turns out that, and, and I'd kn known this before, even though we said these two uh, Rivolis and Blue Threaded Mountain Gems had complete molts, uh, they actually have partial molts. And you can see at a year of age, they still have worn out juvenile primaries. Same with these three species here. The interesting guys are Lucifers, which seems to only have a limited to partial body feather molt, and that's very similar to North America, other North American smaller species. And then broadbilled, which really was the most variable, it, its preformative molt could go from partial to complete. And then white eared also stood out as being the only one with a complete molt. So again, the partial limited to partial involves body feathers, um, some gorget feathers, sometimes most or all of the body feathers, but no, but it didn't, you know, this was well before any primaries got dropped. Partial as I described, retaining the juvenile feathers. I found a few birds and it was pretty much less than 4% that had incomplete molts where they would replace one or two primaries and then stop. So in this broad build, it's hard to see, but P1 
P1 and P2 have been replaced and now it's been arrested, I believe. Um, so it won't mold anymore. And then uh, the white-eared was, was uh, different. And that's that it's um, for all of these species pretty much except the broad bills that did mold primaries, the body feathers would get replaced partially or almost completely before primaries went. And in the white-eared, as soon as the body feathers started getting replaced, the primaries did too. So P1 and P3 are already dropped in this bird and it's barely even started the body feather molt. So that's more in line with complete molts in birds in general, whereas having body feathers get replaced well before primaries is, is not a common strategy. So as you can imagine, all of this mold information really affects how you determine the age. So I, I, as, as I as supplementary material to the paper, I put together a little primer on how to age and sex all of these species. And that's at this link here, which you can also uh, get through the uh, other link I provided. So mold terminology, I do believe my results support the fact that, um, that in at least the Lucifer, and this goes for all of our other migratory common species, Annas and black shins and Rufus, that, um, that uh, the first re replacement of primary should be considered the second prebasic molt pulled forward rather than part of a complete preformative molt, which is how we all had it before. And over here, I kind of put uh, months, this is kind of back of the envelope, but um, months uh, from the first preformative molt, I, I saw body feathers to the first primary being dropped. And for most of these species, you can see there's a range ranging from six months in lucifers up to 11 in a couple of them. So in other words, when the first primary, when the first body feather bolted, it wasn't until 11 months afterwards that the first primary molted. Now, if there was a preformative, which if I considered the primaries being part of the preformative molt, this number was zero for, um, for white-eared, you know, as soon as a body feather molt, was molted, so was a primary, and only one month between those two things in broad build. So I think this represents a clear difference between uh, these this group of species. And the key one here is lucifers, which also goes along with um, Rufus and all of our others, so that they only start that molt about six months after the preformative molt starts. But it seems to me to fit better into these other guys uh, than it does to considering that molt. Complete now. Of course, when you I, when you interpret these molts, you want to do it not by anything that we're seeing today, not by timing or location or or extent, but by how they evolved along ancestral images, uh, lineages. And uh, so you have to think about it in a different way. And unfortunately, because extent, timing, and location are very plastic, they're not very good markers to use to try to interpret the evolution of molts sequences. But as we gain more data on molts in birds of the world, I think we'll probably be able to get somewhere with location, extent, and other parameters of molt that'll allow us to possibly identify um, homologies along the line um, from ancestral species. And then I quickly looked at um, these molt patterns um, relative to uh, the phylogeny of hummingbirds and was sort of surprised to find that it actually the molt extent did kind of fit with the phylogeny. The, the uh, mountain gems had partial molts and that included um, giant hummingbird Patagonia, which I'd already uh, discovered had a partial molt through a UC Davis project. And that um, Lucifer and amongst all the bee clade, which is ours, have limited to partial molts and that all these other molts. Um, uh, the emeralds are quite variable, but styles in 2017, this is based over here on McGuire uh, et al. 2014, but it styles um, indicated uh, split the group into four and actually these also divided by those groups like white-eared was in its own group. Anyway, I don't think this is the answer that we still have about 300 species of hummingbirds that we don't know anything about mold of. And because the uh, timing and extent, extent of molts is plastic. I believe it's going to end up being more, have more to do with environmental variables than to phylogeny. So the conclusion on the molt study is that clearly 
a significant resource to uh, Macaulay Library is clearly a significant resource to study mold. So I asked which of these two photos is more informative to me. And so, and, I, and then I also asked, please take and upload images of birds and mold. 76% um, of males in my sample were looked like this. And only about 23% looked like that. And I also want to say, do not neglect the females. 79% of hummingbird photos were this, 21% were females. So, you know, we do have a bias when we're out there to take a take photos of these guys, but they're relatively uninformative as far as molt studies go. And same thing for just about any birds. Here's the equivalent with gulls. Here's the equivalent with humans. I won't stay on that very long. And as acknowledgments for the MOLT study, I wanted to especially acknowledge the contributors who upload photos to eBird because, you know, 30 million photos, you got a lot of contributors. I relied on 174 of them to do this paper where I actually show figures or, or do links. And here are some names for just one of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, age primer. So um, all these people, you know, we can't do this without you guys. So that's great. Okay, I uh, promised I'd go down a second rabbit hole with you all here. I hope I have enough time. Um, the second rabbit hole is um, I started <clears throat> in 1997, I basically just followed subspecies for whatever um, the latest authority said. And it was pretty inconsistent and haphazard. And, since then, a lot of papers have come out um, and, um, you know, sort of questioning some subspecies or the genomic information is not matching up very well with the phenotypic information when it comes to molts. In other words, the genetics don't seem to align up with how the subspecies are being identified. So I started, I made a fateful decision to kind of try to review subspecies again and do something about it. <clears throat> So what I did is, I'm again using Macaulay, and it's another great resource for this. What you can do is filter for the state or even the county within California, and then pick a time of year for resident species. I'd always pick October to December uh, because that's when they're in their freshest plumage, which, which should look alike and not affected by wear. And I'd find stuff like this where I can't even, I couldn't even tell any of them apart, let alone a certain percentage of them. Um, so I'm starting to, and I wanna be careful here. Um, let me see. I wanna say for the revision, I'm gonna be proposing a more conservative approach. <laughs> so I don't know how exactly that's gonna come out. I might not even recommend subspecies except to say, indicate which subspecies I think are actually identifiable uh, especially for a single individual bird in the hand, if you have a 75% chance of identifying it. Um, and, or, you know, I might, it, I might be in a bad mood and suggest <laughs> they just get lumped. But anyway, here are some results so far, and I'll leave the screen on for questions in case you want to um, uh, mull it over. Uh, the, for instance, here one savanna sparrow, I'm going to recommend reducing it from 14 to 8. And that's based a lot on Rising's 2007 paper on this subject, oversplitting of subspecies. And when I hit that paper, I, that's when I decided I'd go back and do all of this. Um, and he actually is more conservative. I think he only recommends six. So, uh, so I'm not being quite that conservative. And I do want to point out that in some cases, the subspecies seem to be pretty good. Junko, I went from 12 to 10. Stellar's J, California J were pretty good ones. Uh, possible um, monot monotypy, which means they're um, monotypic, only one, no subspecies are these. And I want to point out that a lot of these are highly migratory. So for instance, it's kind of hard for me to imagine that Pacific slow fly catchers that migrate from Mexico to the Channel Islands are gonna be that different from the ones that land on the mainland. Um, and then other things I'm looking at are how much clinal variation there might be uh, in measurements and in appearance, and also how much 
variation in plumage there is within described subspecies, and that's quite substantial in a lot of the cases. You know, with the bush tits, of course, I, I purposely picked four that looked identical, but you know, if you look at 10 images of each from a certain state in October, December, you might see average differences, but I, I just don't know if it's a practical delineation. I also wanna say I'm not at all questioning all the people who put a lot of work into describing these subspecies. And I'm sure that their work is valid, that there are these average differences. I, I guess I'm just gonna try to present a more practical view of it. Um, Luke uh, DeSicchio's, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, study, I noticed um, on his intergrades, I would now be recommend they be switched to those two from Sinuosa to Zavoria to Towns and I versus Iliakia. And um, Luke actually mentioned that in this, uh, in this case, there, everything would seem to be clinal along the Alaska and Northern British Columbia coast. And that's what, uh, that's what it looked like from, from images and not only images. By the way, for migratory species, I would choose the month ranges, April to June or some or May to July, depending on the species, but you know, to get actual birds that were breeding there rather than um, migrant birds. So anyway, that's all I got. Um, oh, and American Crow, I just wanted to mention, you know, I was surprised to read Slager at all, which when he split the Northwestern crow, he not only split the, the lump, lumped the Northwestern crow, recommended lumping it, he not only lumped it as a, a species, but indicated that the subspecies wasn't even valid because of clinal variation with American, with other supposed subspecies in every direction. So if that's gonna be the new normal, then all the other subspecies of American crow vary by size only. There's a little, few little other things, but you know, it just doesn't seem like there's much there to work with on the subspecies level. So, um, so there you go. <laughs> now I'm ready for questions. Thanks a lot, Peter. Fascinating as expected. Mm -hmm. And we have time for a few questions. Um, one, are there enough images of Xanthus's hummingbird to see if it follows the white eared's different molt strategy? I'll bet there is, <laughs> I haven't mm -hmm. done it because <laughs> it's not gonna be in my uh, book. And so I have to focus on that first, but yeah, very good question. And I'll bet, you know, uh, maybe in another five years, whenever I get done with this, I'll take a look at that question as well. <laughs> uh, for the migratory species, broad-tailed Rufus calliope and black chinned in the West, John Dunn has not noted flight feather molt in late summer and fall. You mean of uh, birds moving south? They all, they all of those guys mold on the wintering grounds once they get to the wintering grounds, and that's why they're six months offset from when they do start the body molt. But John, I'm sure you've seen the, uh, you know, the birds flying south, the young males with that have started to molt their gorget and have a few brilliant gorget feathers. Well, that that's what I'm now and Desi and I concluded for Rufus hummingbird. Um, is what we're going to call the preformative molt. And, and rather than the beginning of the preformative molt followed by this, the end of it on the wintering grounds. And by the way, I, I, I did not see any evidence for pre-alternate molts in any of those eight species, but that would be very hard to detect from photos. All right, there's a question. How do you tell that a hummingbird had an arrested molt? Uh, by the fact that those, those few birds that had stop the molt. First of all, they weren't actively molting at the time. And hummingbirds, when they molt, you see at least one feather's dropped all the way through the molt. They have a timing of it where one feather drops and the other one drops before the last one's grown in. So you always see at least one molting or growing. Whereas in those cases, they were all complete, just sitting there, no molt. And second, I would find birds all the way through one-year-old bird, say broad-billed hummingbirds that had molted P1 to 4. Uh, I, they were all, all, all pretty worn looking, but the P1 to 4 had obviously molted um, a year earlier and then the molt had stopped. So there was clearly no continuation. Of course, I don't know that in the next molt, it didn't start with P5 in that case, but I don't, I, it just wouldn't fit in with what we know. 
All right, and then finally, uh, John Dunn uh, says in Savannah sparrows, possibly bush tits, there are likely two species involved. And he reminded us that the AOS has rectified the crows, the Northwestern and American crows. Um, yeah. So. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a relic myself. I'm a kind of a more of a lumper when it comes to this kind of thing. But so I guess I'll reflect that in my subspecies. But I'm going to be careful and I'm going to maybe not even recommend that they be synonymized, but more say, here's a, here's a different take. And for practical reasons, this is what would be useful or something like that. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, we, we love hearing at these conferences about whatever rabbit hole you've been going down most recently. So we really, we really do appreciate it. Thanks a lot.